and from hopefully next week we can be back on schedule it always works that way we just finished giving a, a talk yesterday we called it god's idiots and it's yes. about how spiritual and from hopefully next week we can be back on schedule <laughs> Okay, so why don't we go ahead and start? I'm going to uh, unpause this thing. Um, Goranga Ganya Gana Go to Goloru Hadam Goranga Guda Chama Go Pyota Kopa Briksham Gopala Gada Rati Dam Yati Singh Gora Govinda Deshi Kavaram Satatam Namami Utama adama kichuna bachi la jachi adile kakola kahe premananda imona goranga ridoya daria bohola baja goranga kaha goranga laha gorangera namore Jai Jana Goranga Bhaji Se Hoya Mara Prana Re Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare Yashaiva Padambu Jabhakti Labhya Prema Bidana Parama Pumata Tasmai Jagan Mangala Mangalaya Chaitanya Chandraya Namo Namaste Chaitanya Chandraya Namo Namaste Chaitanya Chandraya Namo Namaste Madhavira Pigopala Sri Kriyat Kripaya Jadi Tadaiva Sambhaya Pidva Rishi Yustad Priya Janaha Sri Krishna Krishna Chaitanya Sasanatana Rupaka Gopala Raghunathapta Brajabala Bapahima Vanchakopa Tarubhishcha Kripa Sindhu Bhyayevacha Patitanam Pavane Bhyo Krishna Bhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shiva Sadi Gora Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So I'm really, really grateful, everybody taking part in this. It's just my, my life and soul. I want to be able to share a little something with some small groups of devotees. We can go deep together. And I'm really sorry that, that um, we started this program and everybody had some hopes. I'm sure we're going to be there every week. But then because we've been traveling, it's been really hard. And uh, it's going to be harder <laughs> coming up and then maybe a little easier too. We're, we're going to uh, next Sunday, I'm giving a Sunday feast lecture here, so I don't know what's going to happen next Sunday. But then uh, a few days later, we'll go to Kazakhstan. And I think it's going to be hard doing anything from there. We'll see. And then we'll come back. We'll, actually, we'll go to, to check. And it may be a little hard for that week too. I'm not sure. And then we'll... Uh, come back to, to Hungary, and it looks like we're still not sure. It depends on, on, the, on the Indian government, but we may uh, stay here in Hungary for the month of Karti. So uh, I just want to look back a little bit. We're studying, we're on Chapter 5, which is a new chapter. If you have an old copy of Embankment of Separation, this is a new chapter now for this book. We titled it The Ten Stages of Viraha. It's a very elevated subject matter. It's a really ecstatic subject matter. And this kind of topic, I just to, I'd like to just speak about how we can approach it. Because it's just so over the top. We could give some class about it. We could collect some verses from Gujal Nilamani and commentaries by Vishwanath and Jiva Goswami and things on it. 
and we could try to impress people in that way. I've seen some Vaishnavas do that. I had one friend who was a sannyasi. He uh, was giving classes like that, all like anything. And many people were appreciating it, but somehow they were all girls, young girls. And he didn't last very long as a sannyasi. Anyway, I don't think that it's so much appropriate for us. But at the same time, these are topics mostly from Chaitanya Charitamrita. And they're things that we should know about. So the, the way that I want to approach them is through reading, taking turns reading. And we can pause like we did in our last session. In our last session, we, we read to this is from Adi Lula, chapter 13, speaking about Mahaprabhu Sanyas and how he traveled. And then Shiva Prabhupada's purport to text number 41. And... Uh, speaking about uh, how Mahaprabhu applied Krishna consciousness in his own life, or Krishna was a theoretical speaker. And then uh, going on, to te- that was text uh, 39, text 40 and 41, is there's something spoken about how Mahaprabhu is in the mood of Radharani. And uh, we just started, a couple of devotees just now, right? Tony Krishna going to type about Krishna Kun. And... Uh, Prabhupada's purport, I'll read it again. In this connection, maybe I can even share it on the screen. Let me see here. Um, in this connection, one should refer to Shimati Radharani's soliloquy after meeting Uddhava in Vrindavan. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu presented a similar picture of such ecstatic imaginary talking. Full of jealousy and madness, symptomizing neglect by Krishna, Srimati Radharani, criticizing a bumblebee, talked just like a mad woman. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, in the last days of his pastimes, exhibited all the symptoms of such ecstasy. In this connection, one should refer to the fourth chapter, the Adi Lila, verses 107 and 108. So, again, uh, it's so important to have a, a clear conception of how we're approaching this and what is our sambanda with it. Huh? When we have some relationship with someone, uh, that relationship really begins, as we hear in the eighth chapter of the Majjhalila of Chaitanya Chaitamrita, in the um, Ramana, the Samvad, it really begins when there's some mamata. And mamata means when someone has some set, uh, uh, conception or some feeling of, of possession, this person belongs to me. It's my sister, my brother, my friend, my wife, my husband, my lover, my, my children, my mother. It's my person. Mm-hmm. Fix this up. That's called mamata. And any kind of connection that we want to have that's going to be relevant for us, there has to be some mamata there. So the same thing is there for reading. We read something we feel I have a connection with because I, 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 when I'm in Hungary and we want to read about the saintly kings in Hungary, some very interesting history in Hungary with the church and the kings here. And I, maybe I do that because I feel some mamata because my wife is from Hungary and I'm giving classes in Hungary. I haven't been actually studying that, but just as a theoretical example. So what is our mamata with this particular subject matter? This particular chapter, uh, Guru speaks about <laughs> 10 different symptoms of separation. And in our previous discussion, we spoke something about the different types of separation and how separation is the highest thing. Guru is speaking that. And how we can understand that separation is even <laughs> higher than union and the relationship between the two. How really one is not satisfying without the other. Both things have to be there. And uh, we heard some different things from Srila Prabhupada and, and different literatures in that regard. We spoke about the meaning of Vipralamba, how Vipralamba means Tatra Vipralambo Vipakarshena, Lamba Prapta Yesha Satata. Jiva Goswami says that Vipralamba means Lamba, attainment of a distance. So it means external separation, but internal union. 
And uh, today I'd like to start with this subsection called Embodiment of Separation. And uh, let me bring it up on the screen. And maybe I can make this a little bigger. That's good. Um, Bonnie Biharani, would you like to read since they bring it on the screen? Sure. I can see it yet. But you should be able to get it now. Can you see now? Yes. So just from the beginning, embodiment oh. of embodiment of separation. What is the real Swarup nature of Goranga Mahaprabhu? He is always feeling pangs of separation from Krishna, always crying for Krishna. That is his mood. The deeper he feels separation, the more he experiences deep ecstasy. The more acute the feeling of separation, the more he re relishes union in the heart. Externally, outside, he is crying and feeling separation. Krishna is not close by, he is away. Therefore, Mahaprabhu is always crying, Ha Prana Preshta Krishna, oh my dearest Krishna, oh Hari, oh Hare, oh Rama, Ha Rama. That is Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, chanting and shedding tears. Should I keep reading? Yeah, go ahead. Radharani felt like this. Radharani feels acute pangs of separation from Krishna. She chants Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare and sheds tears. Here, Hare means, O oh, Hare, O oh, Krishna, O oh, Rama. This is described in a scripture known as Radha Tantra. But for a conditioned soul who is chanting, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare means, O oh, Radharani, O oh, Krishna, O oh, Rama. But liberated souls, those who are in Gopi Baba, Radha Bhava, in the mood of Mahaprabhu. For them, Hare Krishna means, O oh, Hari, O oh, Krishna, O oh, Rama, feeling pangs of separation and always crying. That is Vipralambha. That is the crying stage. The embodiment of feeling separation. That is Goranga. Gora is always chanting Hare Krishna and crying. That is his real spirit. It is Radha Bhava. So, we should understand the sarup of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, meaning that the inner mood of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And Mahaprabhu is the embodiment of separation. So we want to get his mercy. We want to get the gifts that he's come to give. But it's important that we understand something about him. And then my Guru Maharaj, he goes on to uh, refer back to this purport, which we just read a minute ago. And he then he cites uh, Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami. I'll go ahead and share this again. CC uh, uh, Adi thirteen forty two, where he speaks about Vijayapati Jayadeva Chandidasa Gita, how these songs of Vijayapati Jayadeva Chandidas Asvadena Ramana Srup Sahita with Ramana Daroy and Srup Dhamma Goswami. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was tasting those feelings. And, and Prabhupada translates it, they thereby nourished the feelings of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. I'd like to share with you something which we included in the original Embankment of Separation in the back of the book as a uh, appendix. Maybe I'll go ahead and read this myself. This is Prabhupada's purport to Chaitanya Chaitanya Adi Lila chapter four. I think it's text one. That's what I've got here. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and read a little of this and break it apart because what, pro, what my Guru Maharaj is speaking about here is spoken about the same thing, kind of thing by Srila Prabhupada. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna's taught the philosophy of surrender to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. One who surrendered to the Supreme can make further progress by learning to love Him. Therefore, the Krishna consciousness movement propagated by Lord Chaitanya is especially meant for those who are cognizant of the presence of the Supreme Godhead, the ultimate controller of everything. 
His mission is to teach people how to dovetail themselves in the entanglements of transcendental loving service. He is Krishna, teaching his own service from the position of a devotee. This is such a very, very esoteric thing. Uh, it, uh, therefore, we, we included this partly because our grandma speaks about how we shouldn't put a peacock feather on the head of the deity of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And it's difficult for some devotees to understand. And perhaps Srila Prabhupada was doing that because it's very hard to understand that God has come as a devotee. And we can understand it. It's difficult enough to understand that God's a little blue boy <laughs> with girlfriends and cows. That's very difficult to get your head around. But when you hear that he held up Govardhan Hill, that he killed a great witch when he was a tiny baby, that he did so many amazing things, then you get some faith. But when you hear about someone who was 500 years ago, and he's a devotee, and not everybody, some people accept him as God, but not everybody. Some people in India today, some writers and things, and, and scholars of Gaudi Vaishnavism, they consider Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to be a great devotee, a great saint, a social reformer. So it's not so easy to understand that person as Bhagavan. And to help us understand that, my grandma has given this book, Embankment of Separation. So as Prabhupada says here, he is Krishna teaching his own service from the position of a devotee. Wow. <laughs> it's a really packed full of sense. He's Krishna teaching his own service from the position of a devotee. Krishna's coming to teach us how to do service, but he's doing it from the position of a devotee. He's in the mood of Radharani. The Lord's acceptance of the role of a devotee in the eternal form of Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is another of the Lord's wonderful features. And Prabhupada, every little word Prabhupada's saying is packed with deep meaning. He, he mentions here it's the eternal form of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Don't have any doubt that maybe this is just a one one off kind of thing that, that uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has come like this. It's an eternal form. And it's one of the Lord's wonderful features. A conditioned soul cannot reach the absolute personality of Godhead by his imperfect endeavor, and therefore it is wonderful that Lord Sri Krishna, in the form of Lord Garanga, has made it easy for everyone to approach him. And the part of the, the purport that I, I was most concerned with, Srupa Dhamana Goswami has described Lord Chaitanya as Krishna himself with the attitude of Radharani, or a combination of Radha and Krishna. Now, just to look back, I, I mentioned this a number of times. I, it's probably not very relevant for you guys in South Africa or in Michigan, but you might sometime meet some Vaishnavas, because there's a lot of different Vaishnavas in the world, moving around today, who are outside of Iskand, and maybe they're in the Advaita Paribar. In the Advaita Paribar, they, 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 they don't appreciate our line so much, Shiva Bhakti Siddhanta's line, and one of the complaints they make is they say that you feel that Radha and Krishna have become one as Garanga Mahaprabhu, but they stress the difference. There's oneness, but there's difference. So Srila Prabhupada, I, I think, uh, reconciles this very nicely in this beautiful sentence. Subdhamana Goswami has described Lord Chaitanya as Krishna himself, nomi Krishna Sarupam, but Radha Bhava Duti Suvalitam. He's with the attitude of Radharani. So he's Krishna, but he has the attitude of Radharani. It's not necessarily that the atoms are molecules of the two bodies, and I don't know exactly how that works. If the, if the divine couple have ordinary atoms and molecules, I don't think they do. It's not exactly that their bodies have merged together in some kind of like Play-Doh thing where you take two different colors of Play-Doh and you mix them together and you're playing in the clay as a child. But uh, that Radharani's mood is not different from Radharani. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is Krishna, but the mood of Radha is there and the complexion of Radha. So it's really not a problem. Mm -hmm. In this beautiful sentence, Shiva Prabhupada reconciles that, that point. Prabhupada goes on. The intention of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, excuse me, Lord, the intention of Lord Chaitanya is to taste Krishna's sweetness in transcendental love. He does not care to think of himself as Krishna because he wants the position of Radharani. 
we should remember this. Hmm? A class of so-called devotees called the Nadia Nagaris or Gora Nagaris pretend that they have the sentiment of gopis toward Lord Chaitanya, but they do not realize that he placed himself not as the enjoyer Krishna, but as he enjoyed the devotee of Krishna. The concoctions of unauthorized persons pretending to be bona fide have not been accepted by Lord Chaitanya. Presentations such as those of the Gora Nagaris are only disturbances to the sincere execution of the mission of Lord Chaitanya. Lord Chaitanya is undoubtedly Krishna himself, and he's always none different from Srimati Radharani. But the emotion technically called Vipralamba Bhav, which the Lord adopted for confidential reasons, should not be disturbed in the name of service. Hare Krishna Bhuji, nice to see My Guru Maharaj cites this statement in, in, uh, in Banquet of Separation. He says that, you take a mat, it'll make you more comfortable sitting in that. He says that the emotion uh, known as Vipralamba uh, which the Lord adopted, should not be disturbed in the name of service. A mundaner should not unnecessarily intrude into affairs of transcendence and thereby displease the Lord. One must always be on guard, Prabhupada says, against this sort of devotional anomaly. A devotee is not meant to create disturbances to Krishna. So this is a very deep point. I, I, I was thinking about this recently, actually to tell you something a little bit kind of social and political, <laughs> because we're all interested in social and political things, isn't it? <laughs> If I just talk to you about the 10th canto of the Bhagavatam, you may fall asleep. But if I tell you there's something really social and political, it's kind of, oh, everybody, <laughs> everybody wakes up. Huh? So tomorrow, I'm having a, a chat with some devotee who uh, wants to speak to me on behalf of the Deity Worship Ministry in Iskand about the peacock feather on the head of the Deity of Mahaprabhu. And I've really been thinking about this subject. Uh, I've spoke about this before with this group. I'm not going to necessarily go over all the same things we spoke before, but I'd like to speak something about it in a social way. Right now, I, my grandma has previously requested me to write something about this topic, and, and he liked it. In fact, he liked it so much that he submitted to the GBC in his name as a, as a proposal that we not put a peacock feather on the deity of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Um, so that's a little close to my heart. It's my grandma, she wanted me to say something about and But I found over the years, it's a little difficult because Srila Prabhupada personally told Janani Vas to put a peacock feather. And it's hard for me because Janani Vas Prabhu is a very worshipable, wonderful devotee. Prabhupada told, and I've had discussions with him about this, Prabhupada told Malati to put a peacock feather on the deed of Mahaprabhu. So when I have this discussion tomorrow, what I what I decided that I want to try to tell to speak about the devotee about is that this is a historical fact. And uh, Prabhupada said that. And if somebody like one of my the followers of my grandma tries to minimize that or negate that, it's not going to work. The devotees won't be happy. But at the same time, in our society, if devotees try to claim that we should, everybody must put a peacock feather on the deity of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, that's also going to be problematic. Here in Hungary, they don't do it. But Shil Shiva he, he said, this is not proper Siddhanta. And moreover, in the Gaudiya Mutt, and this is not uh, some, this is not a controversy which belongs to me. I don't have it tattooed on my chest. And when I was born, it wasn't that there was a voice from the sky that said, I want you to go and discuss it and, and resolve this problem in ISKCON. It, it doesn't belong to me. If I die right after this class, the issue is still going to be there. And no matter what happens with this issue, I'll still be part of Prabhupada's movement. I'll still be part of ISKCON. But I'm not going to change my, my understanding of it, even if someone orders me. And there's many other devotees who have the same understanding. So the real issue to me is, is how can we as a community, how can we reconcile these differences? And a nice example, I think, is given in another controversial subject. Oh, gosh, I hope I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> and that's about the source of the jiva. And my grandma is in general. I think somebody here is not muted. 
I don't know who it is, but please That's everybody. Me, sorry. Okay, thank you. Uh, me, he spoke the same thing which Prabhupada says in his books, and the same thing which Bhaktivinoda speaks, a number of different acharyas, that the jiva doesn't fall from the spiritual world. And that was controversial in, this, in, in our movement, because some devotees, they say, they, they cite other letters where Prabhupada was very clear. In some letters and some conversations, Prabhupada was very clear. He said, we fell from the spiritual world, and even if you go back, you can fall again. He said in one letter. But in his books, <laughs> in the third canto of the Bhagavatam, in the, in the seventh canto of the Bhagavatam, he uses the word, the conclusion. He, in the third canto, he says, the conclusion is that no one falls from the spiritual world. So there's some controversy about this. I'm not trying to champion either side. I'm not even trying to champion the peacock feather thing right now. But I'm more interested in sharing with all of you a conception of how we can live together as a community with these differences. And I'm using this example of the uh, fall of the jiva, or no fall. And my Guru Maharaj, uh, they had some discussions with GBC body about it. And he came back from Mayapur that year and he gave a talk and he said something which I, I really take to heart personally. He said that, why can't we say either way? Why do we have to insist that one way is true and the other way is not true? Since Srila Prabhupada said both things, why can't we accommodate both sides? Now, in the case of the peacock feather, I'm not aware. Uh, well, Prabhupada did mention uh, to uh, uh, hmm, the hippie poet Allen Ginsberg that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu doesn't have a peacock feather. And Prabhupada, when he had the devotees make the paintings of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Chaitanya Chaitamrita, even the, the formal painting of the Panchatattva, which the devotees worshipped as a deity, Prabhupada didn't have them put a peacock feather. But perhaps more seriously, amongst the Gaudiya Vaishnavas, no one does it, except the Nadia Nagaris or the Gora Nagaris who are an upper sampradaya. But Srila Prabhupada instructed a few devotees now, I, I've been researching this thing for over two decades, actually over three decades, I think. And uh, I've never found anywhere where there's even a recording of Srila Prabhupada saying to do this, to put a peacock feather. There's no letter from Srila Prabhupada that I've ever found. It's not in the folio anyway. Uh, th there was no formal statement from Srila Prabhupada that everybody must do this or should do this. Even there was no explanation from Srila Prabhupada why devotees do it. And, and I find that interesting. And that's significant for us as a society because I feel like I have my particular instruction from my Guru Maharaj, a particular mood. I'm going to keep that close to my heart. You can't take that away from me. It's wrong. And you also can't kick me out of the society because I'm going to stay here in the society. But I'm not going to fight with everybody about it. But I'm also going to respect my Guru Janas, Janani Vaskabu and Malati, who have another different understanding. So the real question is, as a society, can we accommodate both things? And my suggestion is to this devotee tomorrow is going to be that why can't we have both? Why should we, why should we try to make a rule and make the devotees in Hungary unhappy? Who, who don't, and, and the devotees in many different places now who don't want to put a peacock feather in the Didi Mahapur for whatever reason. Or why should we insist that it not be done when, when the devotees in Mayapur have been doing it since the time of Srila Prabhupada? Why can't there be a little different sometimes, standard in different places? Because both things are correct, because Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, he said very clearly, he instructed the devotees in Chaitanya Bhagavat that we should not offer the symbols of Krishna to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And he forbade the devotees in the Gaudiya Mutt from... Uh, putting a peacock feather on the deity of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. We're not going to change them. And as the Gaudiya Mutt becomes stronger, which is reality, they're also becoming more popular in the West. And as we become more popular, we're going to meet and there's going to be discussions. And what are we going to say? Is Are we just going to tell people that, well, we do it because Prabhupada told him one devotee one time and that's just it. And we have no philosophy. We may do it because Prabhupada told them and that's that's our philosophy. He's our Guruji. He's a, he's a founder of Charyagra movement. But 
It's not that Prabhupada forced everybody. And in fact, Srila Prabhupada understood this mood. And therefore, Prabhupada said that we should not disturb the mood of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in the name of service. And my grandmother felt that was very clearly speaking about offering him a peacock feather. So it doesn't mean that we should be, uh, the nature of young persons in this world, they want to fight about everything. It doesn't mean there's no necessity of going and quarreling and fighting. I'm a member of the society and I'm never going to leave the society, but I don't have to think the same way that everybody else does, nor do I have to try to push them to think the way that I do. I can be perfectly peaceful and comfortable having my own standard and some other people have another conception and I'm open also for discussions about it. So that's a big speech <laughs> and a small topic. I'd like to continue here. Um, I'm just going to uh, flip over a little bit real quickly here. Some other things from Srila Prabhupada from uh, this new chapter of, in, of the Banking Separation, Chapter 5, and what Guru Maharaj is saying. Uh, he, he read again from that purport in the verse, uh, how Vijapati Jayav Chandi Das Gita, how Mahaprabhu was relishing uh, these songs of Vijapati Jayadeva and Chandi Das and the other way. Uh, Ramananda Roy and Sutamana Goswami were nourishing the feelings of Mahaprabhu. So then Guru Maharaj is speaking about Mahaprabhu is always feeling separation from Krishna. He's in the mood of Radharani. He's always crying. And then he goes on to say that Radharani has different stages of conditions in her feelings of separation. And this is our topic. <laughs> it's a very technical topic. It's a very high topic. And as Guru Maharaj sometimes would tell us, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta said famously, Radhakum, you're not ready for this, but you should know that such a thing exists. It's not that we should say, oh, I can't read this because it's too high, but it's in Srila Prabhupada's books. It's in the books of our Goswamis. And we have, we spoke about this extensively before, and I'm going to keep pounding it on us again and again, because we have, we've, told so many devotees who are new devotees that, that you shouldn't read these things yet. Although we distribute the Chaitanya Charitamrita sometimes on the street, we distribute whole sets to brand new people, and we're actually hoping they read the book. <laughs> it's a little contradictory if we think about it for just a moment. Actually, we think about it, really our concern is that the new devotees don't go off the deep end and try to imitate something try to pretend they're on a platform that they're not, and rather they focus on topics and philosophical points which are the most relevant for them. That's mamata, we were speaking about in the beginning. That's, mamata means I have some connection with this. I probably need to hear about how we should not have illicit sex, and we, we should follow four regulated principles, and, and, and I'm not the body. Those are what most of us need to hear about a lot. We need to be reminded of that. And therefore, Shiva Prabhupada spoke mostly about that. But if we don't understand what's in Shiva Prabhupada's books, we, I, I've seen many times devotees lose inspiration because they think, okay, how many times have I heard this? You're not your body. Give me a break. You know, over and over and over again. Come on, isn't there anything more? And sometimes they want to go somewhere else. They go to some other Gaudiya Vaishnavas outside our line, we're speaking something more juicy from the 10th canto, which we're also supposed to read, by the way, in the form of Krishna book, or about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in the Gambira, these things, in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. So this is one such subject. So we're going to approach it in this way. We're going to mostly read, and we're going to discuss little by little, and it's really not something which we probably have so much mamata for, so much identification with it because it's really, really high stuff, but we should know that it exists. Okay, so let's, with that introduction. Uh, so, Guru is saying that Radharani has different stages of conditions and her feelings of separation. The same stages, the same feelings have been manifested by Mahaprabhu because he's in Radhabhav. There are 10 stages, Dasami Dasa. Mm -hmm. Now, this Dasami Dasa that he's speaking about here, he doesn't mention it, but these are 10 stages actually of Sudura Prabhas. There's four different types of separation. There's 
before they meet. Purvarag, there's uh, Purvarag is the Purvarag is before they meet, but they've heard about each other. Just to review, there's Man when Krishna does something really bad. He comes to see Radharani. He's got some lipstick on his face from another gopi. It's really, and Radharani becomes very angry. There's separation caused by that. There's Prema Vaichitya, which is inconceivable when Radha and Krishna are together, but they're, they're feeling separation, such as when uh, Krishna's leaving Vrindavan and he's on the chariot of Akura and Radharani's there. They're together, but she's feeling separation. That's Prema Vaichitya. And there's other examples of that, which we've given before. And indeed, uh, this is spoken about quite a bit more in this book. We'll go to that later. And then there's Prabhas, and Prabhas is two types, Dura Prabhas and Sudura Prabhas. Someone's downstairs. Uh, Dura Prabhas means when Krishna goes away from a distance, like to uh, Gokul or uh, Nandagaon or some other place to herd the cows, and the gopis can't see him for some hours. That's called Prabhas Vipralamba. Sudura Prabhas is when Krishna goes to Mathura Dwarka and the gopis don't know. Hey Krishna, you see Prabhu. Huh? The gopis don't know if they'll ever see him again. So uh, we just had another guest just came in. Let's just see Prabhu. He's my good friend. We have a similar background. <laughs> and very few devotees in our society have a similar background. <laughs> it's another topic. Um, he was a street musician before you join us, what I say. So we're reading something from this book, Book and Bank and Separation, just to fill you in for a second. And it's kind of a real high subject that we're reading about right now, about 10 stages of feelings of separation that Radharani has. And we're just speaking about how do we approach this? What do we do with it? It's just so inconceivably high. And my suggestion was that we, we deal with it because this is something we're supposed to hear about. It's in Prabhupada's books. But let's just do it at a bite at a time and try to digest it and just read through it and not try to own it because it doesn't really belong to me, but still it has some relevance for me. There's some mamata. Mamata means I have some sense of possession. There's some mamata for me because it's coming from my Param Gurudev, Shiva Prabhupada. It's coming from Rupa Goswami. They meant it for me. So I have some right to read it. So there's 10 stages. Chinta, anxiety. Jagara, wakefulness. Udvega, mental agitation. Tanava, wasting away of the body. Malinangata, uncleanliness. Palap, talking like a madman. Vadi, disease like. Unmada, madness. Moha, fainting. And the tenth and last, Mitu, or death. And then he says, I'll explain these stages one after another. So we'd like to ask Chaitanya Prabhu, would you like to read a little bit from this, what says unlimited ocean? You have to unmute yourself, Prabhu. I think, I can't hear you anyway. I can't hear you. Can any, can uh, Bonnie Bihani, can you hear him? Can other people hear him? No, no, I can't. Okay, let, let's just jump a little bit and we'll come back to Chaitanya Prabhu. Nandarani, you want to read a little bit for us, please? Yeah. We'll come back to Chaitanya Prabhu. Um, unlimited ocean. The first stage is chinta, thoughtfulness. An example is given in Hamsadutta, on elaborated Practice in his Bengali commentary to Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita and here for 1453. Okay, it's all right, Nandarani. I know you're nervous. <laughs> a lot of devotees get nervous when there's a lot of Bengali or Sanskrit. Like, oh God, I got to read this. I'm going to look really foolish. It's okay. Uh, just a little comment. When we worked on this, I uh, it was a lot of work because we these verses that we we found them in the Bengali commentary of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, and Guru Maharaj is quoting the Bengali, which we transliterated, and it's really good. And there's a reason why we, we include the Bengali, because if you, if you know some Bengali language, even a little bit, wow, there's so much more in it. 
just like Gorni Taipabu can share some poetry with me by some famous Hungarian poet. And there's some really good Hungarian poets. I know some are very spiritual. And he can explain it to me in English. But <laughs> it's one dimensional. You, you can get some idea of what's being said, but to really relish that poetry, you really have to learn the original language. Uh -huh. And similarly with the Bengali. So don't worry, Nandarani, it's okay. Why don't you just continue, just read the translations here. If you, unless you want to read the Bengali, what, what would you like? I think I'll go with it. I'll go. <laughs> okay. A Kura came by the order of Kamsa to take Ram and Krishna to Mathura. When Rama and Krishna, who are Gopi Hidananda, it was a pleasure to the house of the Gopi, went to Mathura, the Gopi, especially Radharani, felt very acute times of separation. Radha was the most acutely affected. Her head reeled. She couldn't stand up, feeling acute pain in her heart. She thought deeply, I cannot survive, I'll die. I cannot tolerate the painful feeling of separation. So this is, uh, Guru here is discussing about chinta or thoughtfulness. Chinta means the mind. There's a deity of Lord Shiva, really cool deity, uh, who said to been there since uh, Dwarpar Yuga. And uh, near to uh, Goku, we, I like to go visit that deity. He's called Chinteshwar Mahadev. He's the Ishwara of Chinta. Chinta has a number of meanings. Chinta means consciousness. Chinta means sometimes the mind. But Chinta generally means anxiety. And so as one of the, the dasa, dasa ni dasa, one of the ten different symptoms of Sudhura Prabhas, Vipalamba, right? we're speaking about that technical thing, uh, it means this intense anxiety. Chinteshwar Mahadev is there. Uh, there's a couple of different explanations about him. One is that he was meditating so deeply on Krishna. He became so aware, so absorbed in Krishna's chinta that he, he manifested this deity there of himself. Another explanation is given, which is appreciated by the bridge bhasis. They say that that deity was worshipped by Mother Yashoda because she was full of chinta. She was full of anxiety about her gopal. <laughs> because her little boy was really difficult. Nandirani, you think your boys are difficult. <laughs> but Krishna was so difficult. And, and, and her love for, for her, just you have love for your boys. We can try to understand Mother Yashoda's love. But Mother Yashoda's love for Krishna is millions and millions of times greater than any mother's love for her children. And uh, she would see poor baby Krishna going and playing with snakes and putting them on her lap. Sometimes he would play with swords and sharp things. He'd pick them up as a little baby. And she was just <laughs> constantly freaking out, we would say in America, and, uh, and so much anxiety. So she was going and worshiping Lord Shiva. You please take away my chinta, my anxiety. <laughs> so he's known as Chinteshwar Mahadev. So we're hearing here now about Srimati Radharani and this is being paraphrased again. This is from uh, Hansa Dutta. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta is paraphrasing this in his commentary on Chaitanya Charitamrita. And, and I want to stress again that please don't be so nervous about these things. This is legal. It's wanted, in fact. It's not only legal, but it's wanted that we should read these things. Sometimes devotees, they say, Prabhu, we shouldn't read that. But then you see them watching the news. Or reading a newspaper. Well, I, I, I would rather hear Rupa Goswami's words than the newspaper's words. Mm -hmm. I read the newspaper sometimes too. I'll, I'll freely confess. I'm not so, so purist. But of the two, if you want to be a purist, then don't read the newspaper. If you're also not, they only read you know, certain things in Srila Prabhupada's books. But we should understand Srila Prabhupada wrote this. And in the beginning of Chaitanya Charitamrita, let me find Prabhupada's Flip over here real quick if I can open it. Real quick, maybe I can't. I'll try. Um, Prabhupada dedicates the Chaitanya Charitamrita to his disciples and followers. And it, the book is meant for them. 
I remember years ago, one senior devotee, who was our temple president in one place, I won't say where, but he, uh, he was telling us, he told me personally, he said that, that actually Chaitanya Chaitamrita is not for the devotees, but it's for scholars. And I, I felt a little hurt, a little unhappy. It's not a, a popular, it's, it's, some people think that way in our society, and no problem, we have different understandings, as I mentioned earlier. But it's probably not going to fly very good because Srila Prabhupada dedicated the Chaitanya Charitamrita to his disciples and followers. He wanted them to read it. And Srila Bhakti Siddhanta said, there's no question, he wanted devotees to read what he wrote. If we want to come close to them, we want their blessings, we should read what they wrote. But we shouldn't do it in, in, a, in, a, uh, uh, in a wrong kind of way, in a false imaginary kind of way where we think, oh, I'm, I'm so elevated. Prabhupada didn't like the Gopi Bhav Club, famously. The boy was trying to imitate something they weren't ready for. But Prabhupada never said, don't read Chaitanya Chaitanya. So, okay. Nandarani, you want to continue that contemplation? That contemplation is like an unlimited ocean in which Radharani is drowned in the deepest region. Then she considered, my dearest Krishna, Lord of my heart, must come, must come to Rajabhumi to inquire about me. And if he hears that I am dead, <laughs> it will be very intolerable. He'll get too much distress. His heart will be very pained. He will never get happiness. Deliberating like this, she thought, no, I won't die. Although it is so painful that I cannot tolerate, still, I cannot die. She decided not to die because it won't please Krishna. This is <laughs> thoughtfulness, Shinta. So what a beautiful description. What an amazing, I mean, people like art. The culmination of art is to try to understand love of God and to come closer to the Lord. I'm going to drop in, in our Sangha here uh, in the WhatsApp uh, this particular chapter so I can put it on my phone and so that some of the devotees here in the room can also maybe read something. Let's see if that works. Yeah, it's working. Um, so here, Rupa Goswami in Hansaduta and Srila Bhakti Siddhanta is giving some, they call it Bengali Paya. Paya means this particular. Uh, Jaho Bhagavata Pada Vaishnava Rastane Ekanta Asraya Koro Chaitanya Charane. That number of syllables, which is the same number of syllables as these verses here, that's technically called Bengali Paya in, in poetry. And uh, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta is giving us this and giving us a window to understand the mind and emotions of Shimati Radharani. Wow. <laughs> what an astonishing thing. What an astonishing thing. So, okay, maybe it's so high for us and whatever. And maybe sometimes we feel uncomfortable. Why do we feel uncomfortable? I don't like it. Why should we feel uncomfortable? This is Prabhupada's books. Why should we feel uncomfortable with our, our grandfather's books? It's so important. We should hear these books. I think maybe we feel uncomfortable because we're attached to our body. We're attached to our certain situation. And this other thing makes us feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So Srimati Radharani in her ecstasy, she's contemplating that this is what's going on in her mind. I, I can't live without Krishna. I should just die. But no, that won't work either. If I die, then, then Krishna's going to be unhappy. That won't work. Mm -hmm. Chaitanya Prabhu, are, are you there? Can can we uh, can you read something? Let's try. Can you hear me now, Prabhu? Yeah, I sure can. That's great. Okay, so, yes. and then I'm going to try to read something with the devotees here in the room. I'm not sure if my mic here is working or not. So I don't know if that will work or not. But, but uh, you go ahead. From Sleepless. Okay, sleepless. Then comes Jagara. Mm -hmm. Wakefulness. The second dasa condition is described in Rupa Goswami's Padyavali and elaborated on by Srila Bhakti Siddhanta. I'm also going to skip the Bengali if it's okay. 
<laughs> All right. Radharani says, Oh, my dear girlfriend, Vishaka, I'm very, very ill-fated. Uh, Bhagya Hina. That woman is glorious who, although separated from her dear most love, sees him in a dream. But when Krishna left Rajapur and went to Mathura, sleep developed enmity towards me. If there is sleep, there are dreams. But sleep has stopped coming to me, so I cannot dream. I'm such an ill-fated woman. This is the second state, Jagara, wakefulness. So this is so beautiful, so important for us to understand this. And just as a footnote also, we, we were giving a talk yesterday about God's fools, or the idiots of God. And there's a wonderful book, well, I know how wonderful it is, but it's a nice book, I think, called um, Madness of the Saints, written by one secular scholar who studied religion, and she's written a whole book, and she includes Gurukha Shodas Babaji, <laughs> and there's some different Islamic saints and different persons. And her point is that there's madness sometimes amongst the saints, and it's a fascinating thing to study that madness. What to speak of studying the madness of Srimati Radharani. And if we don't understand something about the madness of Radharani, how can we understand Chaitanya Mahaprabhu? It becomes really strange. This guy rubbing his face against the wall and blood coming out and his arms and legs stretching out and, and the bones breaking or something and, and coming back in his body. And, and it, it just becomes too weird. But if we can understand something about the, the mentality, and by understanding Mahaprabhu, we can understand Radharani, and vice versa. If we want to understand Mahaprabhu, we have to understand Radharani. So this Jagara, this is the second dasa, the second condition of these 10 different stages. And this refers to someone, Jagara, someone who Jagara means to get up. They, they, they can't sleep. And we see that that's conditioned in mad persons. We see that in Srila Prabhupada. He would only sleep for a few hours. I, I saw that in my Guru Maharaj. I traveled with him as a servant for about, I don't know, four, six weeks, maybe four weeks, six weeks. And during that time, he would average sleep maybe three or four hours a night. I know because that's all I slept <laughs> with him. And there were at least two nights he didn't sleep at all. He was traveling. And uh, it's, it's quite an intense thing. Srila Prabhupada wasn't fond of sleeping, and it's not just some mental calculation. I've seen devotees, sometimes they try to limit their sleep. I'm going to become more advanced, Prabhu. <laughs> I, I won't say names, but one very well-known and very revered in me, uh, sannyasi guru in our movement, he told me once personally, he said, you know, Madhavananda, I did austerities for many, many years. And he, he was really austere. I won't go into the austerities that he did, but very sincere, very intense austerities, sleeping on the ground and, and like that, as a sannyasi with disciples, who just very, very austere. And he said to me, he said, you know, the only thing that I got was bad health. <laughs> <laughs> of course, that's his humility speaking. I, and, 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 and I don't think, in his case, I hope, that he was, you know, I don't think he was doing those austerities to become more advanced necessarily, but sometimes we do. Sometimes devotees, they think, you know, I'm going to, and I've heard devotees even giving classes and things, how, how you can start cutting back your sleep, but you should be careful with that. Devotees have become very sick in that way. Devotees, devotees even have had some madness. We've had devotees commit suicide and things in our society because they're trying to artificially do something which is not appropriate for them. And this Jagara is one very good example. This is a symptom of ecstasy. Srimati Radharani wasn't making a calculated idea that, oh, I think I'm going to stop sleeping so much. As we were mentioning yesterday, Mahabha was kirtan. It's not a calculated idea. It's just an explosion. It just happens. And so Srimati Radharani, this is the second dust of this condition, she just can't sleep. And, 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 and her words, Rupa Goswami is describing in Padyavali, and he's speaking, why is he quoting his different verses, Hansadudra and Padyavali? Because these are verses Srila Bhakti Siddhanta is quoting in his purport. And then Srila Bhakti Siddhanta gives some paya, Bengali paya, a kind of a Bengali translation, the extended translation of those things. 
ground noise is going on with that. So this is really kind of high tech stuff. Uh, and we're hearing here though how Shimati Radharani in her ecstasy, she's feeling bhagihina, right? that I'm very, very unfortunate. I, hina means without any bhagya. Hina means without, bhagya means good fortune. And durbhagya, I'm unfortunate, or bhagihina. Because a woman who's feeling separation from her beloved, at least she has a dream of him when, when, when she sleeps. But I'm so disturbed in separation from Krishna that I can't sleep. And the dream's not coming to me. So that's the second stage, Jagara. Uh, Gwani Taipa, would you want to try reading something? I'm saying try. Let me, I want to ask uh, uh, Vana Biharani and Chaitanya Prabhu, let us know if you can hear him. Okay, I'm going to turn the mic that way. Please try to speak loud and clear. Honeymoon. Can you hear him okay? The okay. third stage is Udvega, anxiety. <laughs> Do you hear? Yeah. The example is given in Hamsa with the text 104. And I sleep. <laughs> Go ahead. No, because. Sorry, sorry. Radharani says, Oh, beautiful face, Lalita, my heart is burning in the fire of acute separation. I have no language to express the pain in my heart. Oh, Lord, what can I do? It's like an unlimited ocean. I'm praying, I'm paying obeisances at your feet. Oh, Lalita, please instruct me. Please instruct me. Upadesha Dao, please instruct me. What shall I do? I have no patience. Moment seems like a great long yuga. What shall I do? Please instruct me. This is anxiety. It, it, you know, people spend lots of money going to the university to study psychiatry and to study madness. As devotees, we should understand divine madness. Huh? And this is one of the aspects of it this anxiety. And we see this also in mundane people, someone who has some mundane madness, they're, they're constantly disturbed, they have this great anxiety. Did you know that Mr. Trump is gonna bring an army and invade Hungary tomorrow maybe, and he's speaking some <laughs> kind of crazy way, and they say some strange things, and they really, really believe it. Uh, <laughs> so Srimati Radharani, she also experiences this. There's a divine ecstasy like this. And we should understand something about this so that we can talk to people and tell them that you have your psychiatry. We also have our psychiatry also. <laughs> and we understand divine madness. And people have become very interested in that. What is that divine madness? And there's books, like I said, huh? The Madness of the Saints. I forget your name. David. David. And they call you Deva, that's why. <laughs> yeah, okay, Deva. <laughs> Why don't you read something, Prabhuji? Okay. Up. Can you hear him okay? Thumbs up or thumbs down? Keep just thumbs down if you can't hear him. She's giving a little shaky hand. Okay. Read loud. The fourth dasha is Tanu Shinata. The body becomes very skinny. The example is given in Ujvala Nilamani. When Uddhava returned to okay. back to Mathura, Krishna asked, What is happening? What is the condition of the damsels of Rajabhumi, especially Radharani? Uddhara reported everything to Krishna, and Krishna heard everything with much interest. Uddhara said, Yadupate ki baliba se baba katha. O Yadupati, Lord of the Yadus, what, what shall I say about their condition? I have no language to tell you. Radharani is suffering so much distress and pain in separation from you. I have no language to describe it. Her face is like a blossoming lotus, but the color has completely faded. Her heart is covered with great distress. She is feeling great pain in separation from you. She has completely given, given up food. When someone won't eat, what will happen to the body? They will become skinnier and skinnier. Radharani was becoming like that. One poet has written that her arms became so skinny that the ring from the little finger was worn as a bangle on her wrist. Her body has became, become so skinny in separation from you that her large breasts have completely shrunken into her body. 
Such is her condition. Gani yukta deki yachi suna rasha moi nega de shalila jena shukaye jai. During the summer season, under the scorching heat of the sun, the river dries up. Similarly, the fire of separation has produced such intense heat that Radharani's body has become dried up and thin. This is her condition. This is Tanukshinata, fourth stage. Tanukshinata. So this fourth stage <laughs> is when the, the devotee, they just don't want to eat. They have no interest. Srila Prabhupada, the end of his life, had no interest in eating. Gorky showed us Babaji. He would do his Nam Bhajan on the bank of the Ganga. And he would go for two or three days without eating. And then suddenly his stomach would start making noises <laughs> or something. And it would disturb his bhajan. And, and he would just want to shut the stomach up. So he'd reach over and grab some mud from the Ganga and eat it. And shut up. <laughs> That's Tanakshinita. Huh? That's a kind of, of, of ecstasy and separation. Uh, and also, I, I think it's an interesting here too. Uh, uh, what is it? What are quoting from here. Let's go back. Uh, Ujjal Nilamani. So Rupa Goswami, Ujjal Nilamani, and Shiva Bhakti Siddhanta is uh, expanding on it, discusses this thing how Radharani has become so skinny in separation uh, that her large breasts, I'm sorry, we're talking about Radharani's breasts, but it happens, that her large breasts have completely shrunken into her body. Well, that's really shocking, isn't it? Can you imagine the state of something? It's like a horror movie or something. And what does it remind you of? It reminds me of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in Jagannath Puri, when he manifested that form known as Karma Rup, and his arms and legs shrunk inside of his body. And it reminds us of the form of Lord Jagannath who's Mahabha Prakash, whose arms in, in ecstasy and separation from Radha, his arms and legs have shrunken inside of his body. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah? Okay, I'm sorry. Now is it better? Yeah, I just turned the mic back around. I forgot. Okay, I think this mic is working. I don't even know. Okay, um, anyway, it reminded me of that. Prabhuji, I never got your name. I'm sorry. Batu. Batu. Batu, that's... That's your initial name? Yes. It's a really cool name, Bhattu. <laughs> Maru Mango. Yes. Yeah. Can you read something, Prabhuji? Sure. <clears throat> Blackish limbs. The fifth stage of Malinangata, when the bodily extremities become disfigured and lose their color. That is also described in Ujjwala Nilaman. Ivanisara <laughs> <laughs> Vishakara osta shushka virahakatara, imapunja shirna padmatuya bimbadara, virahavi patturashe vishaka sudina, sharadiya ravitafta kumudara nayana. So here he's saying, Udava kahena, Udava said, huh? Huh? Suno, huh? Agasura mama, you're the enemy of Agasura. He's saying, hey, Krishna, you're, you're my mama, my enemy of Agasura. Karata vayu bhari, bhandu tare sam. Huh? That you should understand this thing. That vishaka osta shushka, shushka means dry. Viraha katara. And the viraha katara, or the stages, katara means like the stages, and the stages of viraha is burning like fire. She has this osta shushka. There's some hot wind. It's made everything very dry. In a similar way, Vishaka, now she's become very, very dry and she's feeling these pangs of separation. Oops. <laughs> Thank you, Gurmi Taipa. Okay, go ahead. Um, go ahead, Bhatti Prabhu. Maya Angata means there is no freshness in the body. Uddhava reported, Oh, enemy of Agasura, Krishna, listen to me. 
When a hot wind blows, the leaves of the trees become dry. Similarly, Vishaka is always breathing heavily, feeling the pangs of separation. Her reddish lips are now all dried up and blackish. When there is snowfall, what happens to the lotus? The lotus becomes faded and black. Such is the condition of Vishaka reddish lips. Vishaka, who looks as beautiful as a fresh lily, is now feeling acute pangs of separation from you. The lily is fresh in the nighttime, but in the day, due to the scorching heat of the sun, what happens to the lily? It withers. Such is the condition of Vishaka. This is Marina Angata. No, no freshness of the bodily color, it is all dried up. Sure. So we, we see this in things. We see this in a mundane way in the material world. Sometimes uh, <laughs> if a criminal he, he he's stolen something from somebody and he's uh, in the shop and all of a sudden the person that, that, that he stole something then walks into the shop with the policeman. Then all the blood drains from their face. <laughs> and they're they're feeling so much anxiety. Huh? So in a similar way, uh, there's a transcendental symptom of ecstasy called Malinangata, when the body becomes disfigured and the color is lost, it, it affects the body. And, and uh, Rupa Goswami explains in um, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu that this astasatvikara bhav, that they reside, these different eight symptoms of ecstasy reside in the body. And when they manifest these ecstasies, they, 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 they appear in the body as tears coming down or the body becoming disfigured, the, the, the color being drained. This is Malina Angata. So this is one of the symptoms. So I'm going to stop there. It's a little late. And also for us here in, in Hungary, everybody's want to take rest. I mean, I'd like to. But I would like to, uh, for two things I want to do. Number one, if uh, anybody else who's online here would like to read something, someone like Krishna Balaram Prabhu, who just joined with us. Krishna Balaram Prabhu, would you like to read something? To get your association and hear your, your, <laughs> your voice, we'll, we'll extend our program a little bit. You can read Prabhu Hari Krishna Prabhu, and Hari Krishna everybody. Thank you. Nice to hear your voice, Prabhuji. You want to read nice. about delirium? Yeah, I could do this. So delirium. <clears throat> the sixth stage is Pralapa, speaking inconsistently. Prabhupada said talking inconsistently. Pralapa is described in Lalita Madhava. Um, and you don't have to read the Bengali or Sanskrit if you don't want. It's up to you. But it's a really I'm nice. I'm fine. Thing. <laughs> Kalan Kriti. My grandma used to quote this verse quite often. Go ahead. Shilupa Goswami has written this. Shilupa Goswami has written this. Kwa uh, Nanda Kula Chandrama verse, and Mahaprabhu has quoted it. These are Radharani's words. Feeling acute pangs of separation from Krishna, Radha, Krishna. Radha is crying. Seeing a dear friend like Lalita and Vishaka, Radha Rani says, Oh, my dear girl. Uh, oh, my dear girl companion, Saki. Where is that moon of, of the Nanda dynasty, Krishna? Where is that Krishna who has a peacock feather in his head? No one else wears a peacock feather, only Krishna. <laughs> Where is that Krishna who plays so sweetly with his flute? Where is he? Where is he whose bodily you is blue like an Indra, Indra Nilamani, a bright sapphire? Where is he? Where is that Krishna who dances in the Rasa Leela? Where is he? So Saki, he is like a soothing balm in my heart, which is burning with the blazing fire of separation. That is the medicine. Where is he? Where is that medicine? I am so ill-fated. Amma has written these uh, I has written this thing on my forehead. It is, it is my fortune. Alas, what shall I do? This is Parapa, a madman's delirium, in, uh, talking inconsistently. In the same way, I'm also thinking, where is that Krishna Balaram? But we don't get to see him. We just hear a voice, but we don't get to see him. 
There he is. <laughs> oh, you'll watch it. <laughs> See <Thank> me. <laughs> okay. So uh, pralap is a really important thing to understand. And there's many saints who say things which externally just don't seem to make any sense at all. Because they're speaking for a different realm. Once uh, <laughs> Gorka Shodas Babaji, one of our favorite examples, or Vamsi Das Babaji is another person we can give examples of. Once Gorka Shore, he was in Nabadweep. And the boys, sometimes the boys, they like to tease saints, sadhus, and the boys were throwing rocks at him. And Gorka Shodas Babaji stopped, he turned around, and he started shouting and shaking his finger. But what did he say? He said, Krishna, if you don't stop this right now, I'm going to tell your mother. <laughs> so, so, what is that? That's Pralap. He, the, the boys are, who is he talking to? <laughs> He's, it's a, a kind of madman's talk. And this is what, what uh, people generally think when they see the devotees. What are they chanting? What are they, they doing? What is this japa thing that they're chanting? What, what is this? It looks like a kind of pralap, but in looks like some kind of mad delirium, mad talks. In particular, though, this pralap is one of the ten symptoms of separation. It refers to this kind of madness when Radharani and the gopis, they're feeling so much separation from Krishna, they begin to speak in so many different crazy ways. And there's different types of pralap. And Shula, uh, Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur has enumerated those especially in the 47th chapter, the 10th canto, the Brahma Gita. And we gave some classes about that previously when we were speaking about that Brahma Gita. I'm not going to go in that direction right now, but the, there's, there's different types of those, those mad talks. Um, Anir, would you like to read something? Sure. Okay. Um, I'm not going to read the Sanskrit, so I'm just going to continue. Dreadful poison. Fine. You make everybody feel more comfortable, probably. But if we can see you, then we'll be more happy. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm a bit concerned. I have a weak internet connection. It might just drop. Okay, okay, that's fine. Yeah, so dreadful poison. The seventh dasa is vayadi. Vayadi means a very high fever. It is mentioned in the Lita Madhava. Okay, so I'm going to leave that out. So Radharani says, Oh, my dear girl, companion of Lalita, please listen to me. I have a very high fever, 109, 110 degree fever produced out of acute pangs of separation from Krishna. What is the example of such a temperature? Well, the goldsmith melts a piece of gold. He puts it in a small earthen pot, covers it, and then puts another earthen pot on top. Then he places it into a blazing fire. He then takes the bellows and blows until the fire becomes more and more blazing. Such a high degree of heat is produced that the little piece of gold inside mouth. So such a fever is there in the body, such a high degree of fever. Such heat is unbearable, intolerable. It is like very, very dreadful poison. It is more intolerable than a thunderbolt. It is like the piercing of a pointed spear in the heart. Such pain I am getting, such high fever, like very dreadful cholera. A cholera patient gets such pain. I am getting such pain. Oh, my dear girl companion, Saki, I cannot describe this piercing pain. It is so powerful. I cannot describe it. I'm feeling such a high degree of fever. This is Vayadi, and this is the seventh dasa. <laughs> so, well, I, it, it's interesting. In Lita Madhav here, Rupa Goswami is describing, um, <laughs> he's, he's give an example of Vyadi. He's speaking about uh, how the goldsmith melts gold. Well, the same example is used by Srila Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur in the 47th chapter of the 10th canto in, in his uh, Sartha Darshan commentary. And he says there that what was the reason why Krishna left the gopis in Vrindavan? He raises a question. If you say that Krishna loves the Braj gopikas more than anyone else, then we may reply, it's a lie. It's not true. He left them. And, and, he, and he went to Mathura and then Dwarka. If he really loved them, it makes sense he wouldn't have left them, right? But Vishnu says, no. Actually, there's a reason. 
because he wanted to put them in this fever called Vipralamba Jvara, or the fever of separation. And the purpose was, he gives the same example, that a goldsmith melts gold to see, to ascertain the purity of the gold. And so in the same way, he said, Krishna purposely left the gopis and put them in this fire of separation, Vipralamba Jvara, the fever of separation, to melt their hearts, their gold-like hearts, and thereby show to the world the intensity of their love. And if Krishna had not done that, then we wouldn't have known about the love of the gopis. So I want to stop there, and I'd like to invite devotees, uh, if anybody would like to share any reflections or comments, it's a little late here, if we could try to be a little quick, it would be good. I, I, I didn't really ask for any comments as we were going along. I'm sorry, I should have. But uh, maybe we'll start with Bana Biharni. Did you, did you get any, any prizes today? Anything you want to share? Even a small reflection. Um, I was really appreciating how you mentioned that most of us don't have mamata for these high topics, but that our mamata could be that Srila Prabhupada and the Goswamis gave these high things for us to read, to hear. So that was really sweet. For me. Yeah. Your grandma likes it when you listen to his lectures. It, it, you know, he gets a lecture and if nobody listens to the lecture, he writes a book and nobody reads it. And he feels, he feels sad that you, you're supposed to be his disciple. You should read that. We're followers of Prabhupada and we should read what he's wrote. You want to add something else? Oh, well, I was just thinking about, you mentioned that um, hearing about Srimati Radharani in separation and her kind of um, shrinking up reminds you of Jagannath. And so I was just wondering, um, I was thinking about how this pastime you often tell, um, how when Krishna comes and sees Sri Mataradani in separation, then he takes on that form of Jagannath. And I was just thinking, I was wondering if you could say something about why is it that it's just when it's when he sees her, like he sees her in that separation that he's affected in that way. And what kind of separation is that? I don't know if that's clear. <laughs> Yeah, sure. First of all, th that that story we're going to be coming across that pretty soon. It, it, it comes later on in this this book, The Embankment of Separation. And for, I think maybe everybody here knows you. You may not know. It's a story about Krishna's return to Vrindavan after uh, he'd left and finding Radharani lying in, in uh, Nidivan on the lap of Lalita with this fever of separation. There's these ten different symptoms, and she'd come to the point of Mithu, or the tenth symptom, which is death. And she almost ready to die. And when Krishna saw her, he jumped off the chariot and he ran to Radharani, but suddenly seeing her became stunned in ecstasy. And that's known as Mahabhav Prakash. And his arms and legs shrunk inside of his body. His eyes became very big. And he manifested the form that we think of as Jagannath. So your question is that, that why did it manifest in, in, in response to Radharani? So it, it, that the, this symptom of ecstasy, was the udipana, or the, the thing which lit it off, which, which set off the, that ecstasy, was Radharani's condition. Just like, just like today, we, we were in leaving Agar, and a kind devotee who uh, was letting us stay in his guest house with no charge, uh, he was, his wife and he were speaking to Krishna Kun. They were speaking in Hungarian. I'm just an uneducated person. I can't understand what was being said. Very unfortunate. But at one point, the lady started crying very emotionally. And I, I became concerned. And, and I, I, I asked, after they left, I asked Krishna Kun, what was, what was it happened? Why did she cry? And she said that, that oh, her husband got COVID very bad. And he went to the hospital and it looked like he might die. And just, just when she was remembering that, she started becoming emotional and crying. So this is a mundane example. 
But when Krishna, when, when she remembers that situation of her husband, when Krishna remembers Radharani, when Krishna sees Radharani in that, that condition, a death-like condition, it, it just overwhelms him completely. Is that helpful? Thank you, Bonnie. Yeah, thank you. So we're going we're gonna to have a talk, I think, tomorrow or the next day or something coming up. Like Krishna Kuhn mentioned something to me about it. I'm looking forward to it. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And everybody in this group, I hope you're really nice to Bonnie behind. She's a real gem. She's really, really special. And, and I hope you welcome her wholeheartedly and we can really have a nice fun together with her. Thank you, Bonnie and Krishna. Um, let's see. Uh, Nanda Rani, do you want to share something? Any, any prizes you won today? We got to see you though, if you're going to talk. Yes, Prabhu. <laughs> um, I think every time you talk about the peacock feathers, my mind goes to them. <laughs> so I was actually thinking about something when you talked about it. And that is that um, I saw that sometimes that peacock feathers are used to decorate things. And I used, I, I, I saw some peacock feathers being used, not actual peacock feathers, but peacock feathers as a decoration on a Vyasasan, uh, on Prabhupada's Vyasasan. And I was wondering about that. Are, are we allowed to use peacock feathers in decoration? Because it doesn't seem appropriate if we're not using it on Lord Chaitanya. Yeah, I don't like to be Mr. Rules and Regulations. <laughs> I, I, and when we talk, speak about decorating something, that's art. And I like to encourage the devotees. But in general, I can say this, if people are coming from India who have some understanding of the culture, the peacock feather is a symbol of Krishna. Although sometimes Radharani wears a peacock feather, as some mention. Sometimes the cows... Krishna decorates the cows or the cowherd boys with a peacock feather. But just in the same way, the boys have a flute. And, and Radharani has a flute also. But we don't put a flute in Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's hands, although we might. And sometimes we, we hear stories about Mahaprabhu also with a flute. But generally we don't because that's Krishna's particular symbol for him. And it evokes Krishna. My grandma, he, he went on to say that, that within Gaudiya Vaishnavism, sometimes they may put a peacock feather on Mahaprabhu, like on Janmashtami or something. I, my general feeling is with all this is that deity worship is an expression of the heart. When we say, when we say, use it, that, that phrase, expression of the heart, that means art. Because everyone's going to have a different expression of their heart. And it's difficult when we want to try to make rules for the whole society. It's difficult here in Hungary. <laughs> I know with, with Radhi Sham and, and New Brajadam and you guys, Nandarani, you, you got to get your husband to bring you sometime to Hungary to visit New Brajadam and, and just have Darshan or Radhi Sham. It's, they're so amazing, such amazing worship, really. And in the past, Shil Shivaram Maharaj, at one point, just as Lord Nishringadev in Mayapur has different eyes, they have like false eyes they put over the deity of Lord Nishring. There's a precedent. And also here in New Brajadam, they were putting eyes over Radharani and Krishna, so they were looking at each other. <laughs> just for certain festivals, certain times. And they weren't recommending that everybody do that in the whole society. It was just a special one-off kind of thing. They got in trouble a little bit, I think, with the deity ministry. And they, they, they asked him to stop doing that. And they did out of respect to the deity worship ministry. But I think the devotees felt a little sad <laughs> about that here in Hungary. And you still see they have some particular special things they like to do for Radhi Sham. And we won't get into that. I don't want to get anybody in trouble. <laughs> but uh, that's, that's, that's art. That's bhakti. We should all have our special way of dealing. Just like you, you go to visit your mother. And there's some special thing she makes for you. And she doesn't make that for your brother because she knows you like this the best. That's her particular love for you. That's the nature of bhakti. Bhakti is individual with each and every person. And when we try to institutionalize art and make art all the same everywhere, then it's really not really art. It's not such, it's not an individual expression anymore. It becomes difficult. And this is one of the reasons why many devotees complain 
about the institution. But the institution's good, it's needed. It should help us to understand what is art and, and how we should hold the pen, how we should make the circles, what is, it, what is it, the science of art and things. We should learn that in, in the temples and our schools. But then as individuals, we should go on and make our own personal expression, which is within the parameters of the descriptions given by our, our acharyas and the shastra and that which we've learned in the temples. But the temples themselves, it's a little difficult sometimes to encourage freedom of expression like that. So sometimes we feel a little nervous about that. Is that helpful, Mandurani? That is very helpful, Prabhu. Yes, thank you. I have another question, or maybe just a comment. Um, when you were talking about, it, the, the phrase that came to mind is that unity in diversity type of book point that you were making, that you can have different sides um, or, or contradictory statements almost, but still be able to sort of resolve that. Um, because we tend to think in this relative way of right and wrong. Um, and I thought of something that my Gomaj said, and I don't know if Shri Papa said it, but I know that my Gomaj said that when Krishna is good, he's good. And when Krishna is bad, he is good. <laughs> <laughs> and and then, you know, when I heard that, I was thinking that that's the absolute nature of something. Um, but but I find it difficult to comprehend. I mean, you talk about Mother Yashoda um, having to deal with Krishna, who was really difficult um, as a child and things like that. We understand that Krishna is on the absolute platform and, and that's why that is the case but all that is tangible to us is a relative thing that right and wrong um i just want to understand how we can get into that mood because we tend to want to be right um which means that it, the other person is wrong yeah uh, these are such important things to discuss there's a good example given both in Chaitanya Charitamrita, we find in Chaitanya Charitamrita and in Chaitanya Bhagava, of Mahaprabhu in ecstasy in Navadvip, one day he started chanting Gopi, 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 Alita, Vishaka. And there was one learned Brahmin boy who was there, and he came to him and said, you should chant the names of Krishna. What are you chanting Gopi Gopi for? You should chant the Gopi just means a cowherd girl. What is this Gopi Gopi? You should, Shastra says, Harinama, 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 Eva Kevalam. You should chant the name of Krishna. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu became furious with him and started running to attack him. So <laughs> how do we understand that, that pastime? Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has a particular ecstasy, but this mundane Brahman couldn't understand it. And for that Brahman, boy, he was actually correct. We should chant the name of Krishna. We chant the name of Krishna because Mahaprabhu likes to hear it, because Radharani likes to hear it. That's the kirtan of our sampradaya. That's the kirtan our, our acharyas have given us. But Mahaprabhu in that ecstasy, which that Brahmin boy couldn't understand, was chanting gopi gopi. And he was giving him shastric advice. Shastra says, Brihanardiya Purana, Hadanama, Hadanama, Hadanama Eva Kevam. It's correct what he said. But he couldn't understand Mahaprabhu. So similarly, we should read these books. We should try to understand something about it. But we can't. It's not that if you go to Shimati Radharani and you say, oh, Krishna is so good. He's so nice. Radharani may say, no, he's not. He's so bad. Do you know he went with Chandravali? He did this. He did that. Just as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu became angry with that Brahman. And we should hear about that. We should hear about their mood, but we can't imitate it. It's not that we come in front of the deity and we start shaking our finger and Krishna, you were really bad today. We're not going to give you any lunch because you were so bad. <laughs> you, <laughs> that's, that's being like a sahajya. We can't speculate like that. Rather, we follow what's been given by our gurus and our acharyas. And for us, we can't imitate this. So even if Krishna's bad, as your grandma said, for us, He's good. His bad is his good. If there's 18 faults in a conditioned soul, 
which Rupa Goswami describes in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, quoting from some tantric literature, I don't remember. And those 18 defects are not found in Lord Narayan. And that's why he's God, because he doesn't have those 18 faults, like getting tired, like telling lies, like becoming confused, making mistakes, and those 18 different types See. of things. But what's paradoxical is that Krishna has 16 of those 18 faults. And those, the faults when Krishna has them are what make him superior to God. <laughs> what make Krishna superior to Lord Narayan, that he tells a lie. And it's so very, very sweet. And, and, and we, we hear about that and we, we laugh and it, it, it endears the heart. And each one of those so-called faults are in connection with his devotees. And we don't see these faults in Lord Narayan. But Krishna tells a lie. Krishna becomes confused when he sees Radharani and becomes bewildered. He's going to milk the cow and he grabs the bull and he starts milking the bull. Huh? <laughs> it's a kind of fault, but it's, it's an ecstatic thing. And, and it's bad, but it's good. It, it, it makes him superior even to God. So we should hear about that. And we put it in our filing cabinet in a certain place that we can understand in, in a philosophical way. But maybe my mama is not exactly there personally. Doesn't really. I can't exactly relate to it. But I should know something about it. And probably we hear that and we think that's really sweet. <laughs> that's really very endearing. And we have some attraction for Krishna. But we should understand, as your grandmas is saying, even when Krishna's bad, he's good. <laughs> is that okay, Nandarani? Yes, thank you, Prabhu. Thank you. It was a great comment. Okay, we're getting what happened to Krishna Balam? Krishna Balam's still there. Krishna Balam, would you have any comments or anything? Uh, not for tonight, Nanda. Prabhu. Thank you so much. Okay, is Nandarani being nice to you? <laughs> She's okay. <laughs> oh. oh. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Prabhu. It's nice hearing your voice. I know you came really late. It was a little hard. Anir Prabhu, do you want to share anything? Real quick. No, thank you. Great, great presentation. Look forward to more. That's it. Thank you, okay. Herbal. That was sharing something. Anybody else here in the room? You guys want to share anything? Any reflections? Something you liked? An impression you made? Something? I want to ask the story when uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had these arms extended and uh -huh. this kind of freak show, like what happened then? <laughs> <clears throat> well, what happened then? Well, first of all, why did it happen? These are, and, and Krishna Daskavaj Goswami makes a comment about this, a very astonishing thing. He says that the symptoms of ecstasy that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu exhibited in Puri, we've never heard about in any Shastra. He says, Shastra Nahisuni. We've never heard any Shastra that speaks about those kind of ecstasies. No one's ever spoken about them. They're very, very astonishing. It's not in Ujjamila money. It's not in, 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 in uh, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. It's not amongst the Esasafi Karabhav that someone's arms and legs become elongated. I remember there's some Babaji's at Radhakun. They made some paintings of Mahaprabhu with his arms elongated like that. And I have to say, honestly, I, I didn't <laughs> really appreciate it, but it was a little horrible. And they also, there's another painting they made of him with blood all over his face, rubbing his face on the wall. And I could see why generally Gaudiya Vaishnavas don't make those paintings. Mm -hmm. Some of made it was interesting. I, I, collected, I collect paintings. Mm -hmm. So I collected those pictures, but generally we don't. So Mahaprabhu, in separation from Krishna, Mahaprabhu's separation in Jagannath Puri is a manifestation of... Radharani's feelings. He's Krishna, Nomi Krishna Sarupam, but Radha Baba Duti. He's experiencing the feelings of Radharani. And as we're hearing in this chapter, in particular, he's experiencing the, the, the feelings of Srimati Radharani in the book, in the chapter 47 of the, of the 10th canto, known as Brahma Rugit, which is we've been discussing in, in our classes on Tuesday, used to be Tuesday morning, Indian time. Now it's I think it's going to be Hungarian time, three in the afternoon. Uh, we've been discussing that uh, some Vaishnavas say that that chapter is the most important chapter of the whole Bhagavatam. Why? 
more important than the, than the Rasa Pancha, Rasa Pancha Jaya, the five chapters of the Rasa Lila, more important than the first chapter of the Bhagavatam, more important than Krishna's appearance, most important because it explains the mood of Radharani. So Mahaprabhu, feeling separation from Krishna like that, he manifests this form. It's, <laughs> it's a completely indescribable form. It's Malinagata. Malinagata means when the body becomes deformed. It's one of the ten different symptoms, uh, but it's a very unique symptom in this regard. Mahaprabhu's body becomes completely elongated. And the only thing that we can comment about it, because we haven't experienced this, and we should understand the point, too, that, that the Bhagavatam itself is described as Prema Moyi Bhagavata. It's made out of Krishna Prem, and therefore it's known as a Bhava Granta, or a book which can only be understood by realization, by ecstasy. As Krishna says in the Gita, Pratyak Savadamam Dhanyam Susukam Kartanabhyam, that that Pratyaksha, we have to personally realize that. And therefore, Gorka showed us Babaji is the greatest scholar of the Bhagavatam, although he couldn't read it, but because he was experiencing that thing. So to us to try to understand the symptoms of Mahaprabhu, all that we can do is just comment what I remember from Krishna's Kaviraj Goswami's regard, just that Mahaprabhu became so ecstatic, and that happened, and he lost his external consciousness, and he, in his internal consciousness, he went to Vrindavan and he saw Krishna. And externally, something happened to his body. And then later the devotees came and they were very, very disturbed seeing him like that. And they began doing kirtan and they brought Mahaprabhu back to external consciousness. At first he was in kind of middle consciousness, confused where am I at? I was in Vrindavan. What have you done? And then he comes back to external consciousness and his limbs and his body come back to normal again. And why we had this question someone raised to us from Jagannath Puri some years ago. Why do we, how do we understand that Subhadamada Goswami's kirtan was a disturbance to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and he chastised him, what did you do? I was seeing Krishna in Vrindavan and you did kirtan and you brought me back here. What kind of kirtan is that? The, the kirtan of Subhadamada, his Alita Saki, should be a kirtan which, which brings ecstasy and enhances the Lord's mood. Uh -oh. um, can you do something with it then? What? Just, just a second. Yeah. yeah, it just goes to sleep sometimes. Yeah. That's okay. Okay, I'm just going to keep speaking. I hope you can hear me. And I'll try to bring the... There he goes. Try to bring the camera, camera back. So... Mm -hmm. We would understand that Srupa Dhamadar Goswami's kirtan should be a kirtan which brings happiness to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, mm -hmm. not brings uh, pain to him. So how do we understand that? Srupa Dhamadar Goswami is Lalita, and Lalita understands the mood of Radha, and Radharani's feelings are just like a roller coaster. And the roller coaster goes up very slowly, and, oh, and then down whoosh, real fast. And then again, it goes up and it goes down. And those are like the feelings of Srimati Radharani. So sometimes she sees Krishna and she's in complete ecstasy and everything's one. And then on the next moment, she's feeling so much separation. So to help Krishna, who's come as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, to realize that, Subhadamada Goswami is doing his kirtan in this way. So Mahaprabhu, one moment, is feeling this intense separation. And then he's seeing Krishna in the suit. Dhamma Goswami comes and does this kirtan, which sounds terrible. It, it, it takes away the vision of Krishna from Mahaprabhu and brings him back to this external world. But that was required. Because in his feelings of separation become even more and more intense. Like Srimati Radharani. That's all I can comment, Prabhu. <laughs> is that okay, Bhattu? It's a good question. Anybody else has anything? Anybody in the other room want to say anything? Okay. Okay. Um, you have something, Prabhuji? Yeah. I, I just had a question. You sort of give an answer. Okay. These, uh, that, uh, so my question is, mm -hmm. it's really hard for me to 
comprehend uh, this concept that uh, in the transcendental realm the greatest ecstasy is these symptoms. <laughs> it sounds so terrible with the material vision, so it's just very difficult to comprehend how how this is uh, how this is the greatest ex ecstasy. Mm -hmm. But you you said that you can really experience or you can really understand when you are at that stage of Bob. <laughs> okay. so. That's good. I, I think you understood. <laughs> you just want to marvel at it again, maybe. And that's why we have books like Madness of the Saints. That's why people are fascinated by divine madness. You know? And we should understand something about it. That it is divine, because it's so hard to understand. There was one Sufi saint who was very famous. And uh, he uh, came to one small town. And everybody said, oh, the sadhus come and this big crowd of people came out to greet him and he felt disturbed because he just wanted to do his bhajan alone and didn't want people bothering him he didn't like people glorifying him and so he stood there for a moment and then he <laughs> he kind of sort of i don't know what kind of clothes he was wearing but in the west he unzipped his pants and he pulled out his male paraphernalia <laughs> and he started passing urine in front of everybody <laughs> and all the people were watching him oh my god he's not a sadhu let's go <laughs> and they all got up and left <laughs> so it's very difficult to understand these kind of things and therefore we want to hear about it in an authorized way otherwise you'll hear about ozzy osbourne a <laughs> black sabbath and once he bit off the head of a bat and ate it, you know. So, I mean, you hear about some crazy thing, and you'll think this is this is also some divine ecstasy or something. You might think like that, but when we want to hear some authorized statements from our acharyas, what the divine ecstasy is. Otherwise, I, I, I've seen in our parikramas and puri sometimes some people come and they'll start chanting. All of a sudden, you see them and they just fall on the ground and they start rolling around. I don't know. I personally, I, I don't bother them, but Sometimes people do that to, and I've seen it, but I'm pretty sure it was not actually genuine because just right after that, there's some conscious. Yeah. Guru Maharaj said in the lecture once, like, if you see something like that, then you know, like, that person is leading up and just like hit his head with your knife or kick his head. <laughs> and if he's really like a son, he's, he's not going to bother, but he comes out like, hey, what happened? What are you doing? Then, yeah, really. yeah. But when it's his real ecstasy, you have to fall down. <laughs> yeah, I, I, That's what he said. I, I think your grandma is just saying it because the devotees once came to Prabhupada, and that there was some person who came to the Krishna Balaram Mandir in Vrindavan, and all of a sudden, Kirtan, he just fell down on the ground and started rolling on the ground and crying. And the devotees didn't know what to do. And so they went to Prabhupada, and Prabhupada said, like, you should kick him. <laughs> and if he's really in ecstasy, then, then, then he won't manifest. I, I feel a little shy, but at the same time, I really don't appreciate it. Once I, I collect books and things, and I speak to sadhus. Once I went to see one particular sadhu who translated a book, and he asked me to start reading some from it. And I was reading it, and all of a sudden, I just read a few words, and all of a sudden, <laughs> and he starts crying. And I felt really bad. Honestly, I, I don't know. Maybe he's on an elevated platform. I don't know. But I felt like I was being raped in public. Like someone was taking advantage of me in public. And, and I just apologized and left and went and jumped into the Ganga with my clothes on to purify myself because mm -hmm. I felt very disturbed by it. Because not that, that his ecstasy might not be real. Maybe it is. But I just felt... It's not right. I don't even know you. And you're showing this very intimate side like that. And maybe you're trying to impress me, and it just doesn't make me feel good at all. It made me feel very, very uncomfortable. So, okay. Okay. Gwani Taipa, we have something you want to share? Let's flip that camera around for him. <laughs> I am in the center now. Okay. Okay, so... A few days ago, you mentioned that English book of uh, School in the World, 
Uh -huh. Well, there's a movie called Schooling the World, yeah. yeah really. So I think we all, most of us, especially me, we underestimating that kind of effect which we got from childhood. That kind of so-called education mm -hmm. is not, 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 not something, a little thing. It's really a slaughterhouse house of, of a thinker, an individual thinker. And we are killed practically by that. Mm. I see your expression also shows some sh some show that you also learned in the Western world, like like when you mentioned that two bodies merging is not like atoms are coming. That's why we are speaking about these things because we learn that bodies from atom is made from atoms. So it's so deeply in us. Uh, and that education also teaching us the critical thinking and criticisms of others. This is so deep, it's so difficult to purify us. So I, I think we just have to, you know, offer obeisances because every, each of us came from that background. And that's impossible to get through until we really purify. That, that takes, takes a lot of Mm. So that's mm. wow. Great comment. Can you flip us around? Great comment. Thank you, Goni Taikabu. Yeah, our education in many ways is more like indoctrination. We're brainwashed in a certain way. We're taught to see things in a certain way that that we should all be make money. That's that's what's going to make you happy. You have to have a house and a wife and a nice sex life and a beautiful body, and that's what's going to make you happy. And so many other values that we get from this Western education. I, I really appreciate your comment. I, I think you you kind of got the essence of what I was trying to communicate today, and that is that we we can't understand this. It's a chincha. It's inconceivable. But even though it's inconceivable. Even though Krishna is inconceivable, we still are supposed to read Krishna book. And we just hear it. As Shiva Bhakti Siddhanta said at Radhakun, I know you're not qualified for these topics, but you should know such a thing exists and you should hear it. And by hearing it, it's not like a mundane thing because that's part of our problem. We're used to understanding something. We read a book. I, I took English literature when I was in, in, in junior college and we studied uh, George Orwell's 1984. So you master the book. You read it five times, you make notes on it and things. You can't master Bhagavad Gita or Chaitanya Charitamrita. This is pratyaksha. It's something that has to be experienced. So we're approaching it with this attitude. Yeah, I had this literature class and I took notes. And I, I, I collected all this information, so this is my process that I'm going to do now. But that's not the process here. The process here is we just submissively, passively hear. Just hear it. And something will happen. Shrinvatam swakata krishna punya shravana kirtan hridyam tisto kibadani vidunoti saritsatam. It does something automatically to our heart if we hear in the proper way. And we have paraspara, there's some back and forth discussion. Okay, that's a great comment. Thank you. So I want to finish with, with Gorni, with Chaitanya Prabhu. We had Gorni Thai, now we have Chaitanya. <laughs> you have any um, reflections you want to bring up with Prabhu? <clears throat> thanks, Prabhu. Yeah, there's, there's so many actually, but I'll just pick out a couple of very, very quickly. Uh, I think some of the other, for me, uh, in the Prabhupada making that comment about how Krishna places himself to be the enjoyer, some of the others struck for me today quite a bit. I think also to the extent that um, to highlight Radharani's position even more, that Krishna himself wants to take that position and be enjoyed in that extent. So what does it mean, Radharani, that position? And then, uh, you know, we, we seldom actually hear Radharani being described as a mad woman, to be honest. So normally she's glorified in so many ways, sweetness and everything like this. And obviously the connection is clear. We hear Lord Chaitanya being described in that way, and obviously Radharani being described in that way is, is, is quite interesting from that perspective. But when you read that first, um, the first of the dasas that, you know, on, on Chaitanya, where Radharani is then feeling that separation like death, 
but she's willing to not die and tolerate that pain so that Krishna wouldn't have some pain. I mean, that does sound like a, in inverted commas, a crazy mentality. But it just shows uh, Radharani's also position of wanting to give Krishna that amount of pleasure that she's willing to take anything on for that matter. So those are the couple of things that really jumped out at me, Julia Prabhu. So thanks a lot for those. You know, it's kind of like if you have a crazy uncle and your crazy uncle wants to uh, buy a, a, a bus so that he can drive to Iceland, which is, he can't even drive to Iceland. He wants to drive to Iceland because the Martians are going to land there and they're going to take over the world and he's going to become part of it. And, you know, he's like really into that. Whenever you have a, a meeting with the family, he starts talking about wanting to buy that bus to go to Greenland or Iceland to meet the, the Martians or whatever. So you don't tell other people about that. <laughs> right when you meet other friends and people you don't say you know my uncle's really a kook you know the guy is completely a nut and he's saying this and this because he's part of your family and you, that's a private thing so similarly with Srimati Radharani these are private discussions when someone becomes a little more they have stronger level of faith they can understand something then we can discuss something about this and they can put it in a certain category of divine ecstasy if they have a strong enough faith. But if they don't have enough faith, then rather you may think of Radharani like the Brahma Vaivarta Purana presents it. She kills demons and she helps create the universe. And, and that's, that's the, the divine mother. We can understand that. Yeah, killing demons, creating universes, that's, that's godly. But becoming mad and, and talking about, you know, why, why I can't commit suicide because then Krishna will become depressed, that's difficult to understand. But in our literature, Radharani is described as Pagalini Radha. If someone wants to read Shakespeare and read about Romeo and Juliet and the great tragedy, tragedies and things that Shakespeare is so beautifully described, which in, in Western literature we, we glorify and we, we appreciate so much, go to Lalita Madhav. See what Rupa Goswami has described, if you have a taste for that. But we have to approach it through our parampara in a proper way through our acharyas and with a proper quality degree of faith. And this is not a discussion we would make. We, we didn't, wouldn't speak about these things in Agar in front of me with a general group of devotees there. But in a small sangha, we have an obligation to devotees. Just like uh, you have a, an obligation to a child to, that there should be no questions which are illegal when he starts becoming a little older. No question should be illegal. When the child's very small, he just say, anyway, because I said so. Don't drink bleach, because I said so. That's why. But later on, you may tell him scientific reasons. It's going to burn your mouth. It's going to die, this and that. Later on, those questions are legal. So we want people to grow up. And there should be no questions which are illegal. There should be no parts of Prabhupada's books which are illegal. But we should understand what is my mamata, what is my sambandha, what my connection with those particular aspects of the books. And if we can't understand that, then maybe it's better if we don't approach them until we do understand in a proper way. All right. That's my reflection and reflection, Chaitanya Prabhu. Thanks so much, Prabhu. Appreciate it. It's really, really sweet to see you guys. Okay, I, I wish it stopped there. It's nine o'clock at night. It's nine o'clock at night for you guys too. It's amazing. I, we're in the same time zone, yeah. South Africa and <laughs> in, in, in Central Europe. Amazing to me. Yeah. Okay, well, only uh, for Pabana Biharni, what time is it for you? About three in the afternoon? Yes. Three o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah, it's easy for you. Okay, so thank you all very much. I'll let you guys know what's happening next week. I, I can't say right now because we have a Sunday feast program here, but I'll try to do something. We may have to, again, do something at this same time we did this week. I don't know. It's nice for me if we have an option of different times too, though. Okay, Srila Prabhupada Ki. Thank you.